worship. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm impressed how many of you avoided uh, drowning on the way to church today. I'm glad you braved the rain to be with us for worship. Um, our call to worship this morning comes from Romans chapter 12. Please join me. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's stand and sing. Call to confession. Paul instructs us, be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. But too often we have blended in rather than standing out. For our moral and spiritual compromises this week, let us offer our prayer of confession. Father,
Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. Thanks be to God. In Christ we are united to God and to one another. can be seated. I'm going to invite our kids to come join me up front for a moment. I love your hat. That's awesome. Hey guys, good morning. All right. How's everybody doing today? Doing okay? All right, good. Um, hey, I want, to, um, I want to show you guys something that I learned as a kid, and it's really simple, okay, and it has these hand motions we have to do. Hey, guys, come on up. Good, good. So here's what I want you to do. Take your hands, and I want you to go like this. Can you do that? Okay. And then bend them together. Oh, see, look. No, my fingers aren't showing. So you got to put your hands like that and bend them together so your fingers don't show. I see your fingers. I see your fingers. Hide your fingers. See, watch, watch. This is hard to do. Take your hands upside down. Your hands are right side up. Turn them over. Upside down. Almost. Like this. There you go. Now you put your fingers together, right? Now when you flip it over, your fingers are gone, right? Okay? This is hard to do. I believe in you. Okay, good. All right. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do a little, little story, okay? So here's the story. It says, this is the church, and then put your fingers up. This is the steeple, okay? And then open up your thumbs. Open the doors, and see all the people. You guys ever heard that before? Your grandma taught you. Awesome, dude. You get a fist bump. That's great. Okay. All right. Let's try one more time. Here we go. All right, guys. You got your hands. Ready? Okay. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. Okay. Pretty good trick. Yeah. And your, yeah, your people are awesome. I love it. So, um, I learned that. My grandma probably taught me that too. I learned that a long, long time ago. Um, and I, I loved it because it was a cool little trick you could do with your hands and because it was a nice story about like, hey, you know, we go to church and we see God and we see people and all those things. Uh, but one day I learned something really important. Um, so I learned that the church isn't the building. Do you guys know that? Like all the time in my family we say, hey, we got to go to church. It's time to go to church. Let's go to church, right? And as a kid, I always thought that meant like this building was the church, right? And so that, my little rhyme makes sense. Here's the church. It means here's the building, right? But that's not what church means. Anybody know what church means? This is a hard question. If it doesn't mean the building, who else could it mean? Who's in the building? Like people, yeah. Like Christians, right? Yeah, good. So, so I think that when the Bible talks about the church, they didn't even have buildings back then. Can you believe that? Like, like many people's houses and stuff, there weren't any church buildings. Church doesn't mean building. Church means the people, right? The people are the church. So just like we think of this as a building where people go to meet with God, so like wherever the church goes, people can meet with God because the church is there. So hey, do this one more time. Will you take your fingers, do my little trick, make a closed door, okay? We're going to say it differently. This time we're going to say, um, here's the church's building. Here's the steeple. Open the doors. See the church. Doesn't rhyme at all, does it? <laughs> Not as memorable. But it's more, it's more right, yeah? So here's what I want you to think. I want you to think wherever you go, whether you're in this building or not, you're the church, 
right? And wherever you go, people get to meet with God because you're there because you're the church. That's kind of awesome, right? You don't have to just be in the church's building to be the church. Wherever you go, you are God's people. You are a place people can come to meet with God. That's kind of cool, right? Okay, so when you go home, I want you to teach your grandmas and your grandpas and your moms and dads this little thing, okay? Remember, this is the church's building. This is the steeple. Open the doors. See the church, okay? All right, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much uh, that we are the church wherever we go, uh, that we are not limited in this place, uh, that um, when we are at school and when we are at home, um, we are still um, where the world gets to come to meet you because you live in us, Jesus. And we thank you for calling us to be the church together. It's in your holy name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. All right, guys, thank you so much for hanging out. Hey, uh, I believe um, that Miss Kim is in the back, so if you're going to kids' worship, you can go back with Miss Kim. And if you're going to worship in Wiggles, um, I think you can walk right out these doors and um, somebody will make sure you get where you're going, okay? Thanks very much. Y'all can head off, to, or if you're going back to your seat, that's fine too, okay? Y'all can head off to kids' worship or worship Wiggles or your seats. And yeah, keep doing it. I love it, Andrew. Keep working on it. Um, and as our kids make their ways back, we would love for you to please stand and turn and greet your neighbor. Old Testament passage this morning comes from the first book of Kings. It's on page 305 of your uh, pew Bible, the blue Bible in the pew, if you want to follow along and read with us. Uh, this is a story of King Solomon. So, reminder, King Solomon is the son of David. He will be the second in the line of the Davidic uh, lineage, the third king of Israel. We had Saul, then we had David, and then we have Solomon. And, and Solomon is the last king of the United Kingdom. So, not like Britain, but I mean the United Kingdom of Israel. So after Solomon's reign, the, the kingdom of Israel will be divided into two nations, the northern kingdom, which will be called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which will be called Judah. So uh, Solomon's an incredibly important figure, and it really is his um, faithfulness followed by his faithlessness uh, that ends up dividing the nation, okay? So we're going to hear about the, the very best part of Solomon's uh, ministry and his, and his leadership today. Um, we're going to pick up in the third chapter in the third verse, early in Solomon's reign. Solomon loved the Lord 
walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I should give you. This is great. This is like the like genie in a bottle kind of moment, right? One thing from God. Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and an uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this your great people. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Let's continue to worship.
Our New Testament passage this morning is the 12th chapter of Romans. We're going to be on page 161 of your pew Bible if you want to follow along. Uh, Paul's going to talk about this idea of the church being a body, and we see this in a number of Charles, uh, uh, Paul's writings. Um, we have another passage like this in 1 Corinthians where he says, if every part of the body was an eye, then where would the sense of hearing be? If every part of the body was a nose, where would the, where would the sight be, etc. Um, but I was just thinking, I love it when like a service comes together. This is a beautiful image for that concept, right? I mean, the handbell choir, uh, I was saying earlier, I'm terrified about ever playing handbells. Like, I might get up and play a violin, but like, then I'm in control, <laughs> right? Like, I'm doing all the notes. Um, but what this is, it's I'm dependent upon everybody else to play their part. That's kind of how Paul sees the church, right, as, as a body where we are dependent upon each other to be a complete whole. Uh, and so, uh, listen again uh, with that kind of in the back of your head as we hear about the call for our life in Christ. This is Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry and ministering, the teacher and teaching, the exhorter and exhortation, the giver and generosity, the leader and diligence, the compassionate and cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So for the last few weeks, we have been thinking about uh, this topic we've called Christ and Caesar. We've been talking about political authority, and I've been trying to lay um, a, a, a foundation for us as we think about um, our, our world and how we interact with the, the realm of politics. Uh, and it, it came to me on a really simple level this week that, you know, I took calculus in high school. Uh, I, it was not a good experience for me. That was the last time I took math, actually, was in high school. Uh, uh, and I don't use calculus very often. In fact, the only time I've used calculus in the last few years has been in conversations with my wife who's a physics teacher to pretend like I know what she's talking about. Um, <laughs> Uh, I took algebra, two years of algebra. I use that a little bit more, not that often, but I use it some, right? And it's pretty functional. I got to use it to figure out staff salaries or how much to pay in per capita this year. Um, but what I use most often is arithmetic, right? I use arithmetic all the time. Uh, and you got to have each one of those for the next one. And it came to me this week that um, figuring out, I made a joke last week that I'll never tell you who to vote for. Figuring out who to vote for is a little bit like calculus. It's really complicated. And also you don't do it that often, right? And then figuring out like what your opinion on issues is and particular topics, tax policy or immigration law or whatever else, that's a little more like algebra. Might hit your life more often than the other. Um, but what I really want to do in these last few weeks, what I've been trying to do is the arithmetic. I want to give you like a, a foundation for how we as Christians enter and engage in this political authority. That's what we've been trying to do. So we talked a little bit about um, the danger of political idolatry, of, of our politics becoming the most important part of who we are. We talked about the danger of um, having contempt on other people because they don't fall into our category. We talked about God's vision of good government and the new heavens and the new earth. And last week, we talked about our struggle against the powers, both spiritual and systemic in our world. So today, I, I want to um, end this series by thinking about um, how we as Christians are called to be um, united, even though we are not always in agreement. Uh, and, and so to do that, um, I actually am going to draw a lot on a, a book by a guy named Jonathan Haidt, um, called The Righteous Mind um, that some friends gave me a, a, a year ago or so. Um, Jonathan Haidt is a, <laughs> he's a Jewish atheist moral psychologist. 
So he's the whole thing. Uh, and I would be the first to tell you that I don't agree with everything in his um, writing, but he has some really interesting ideas. Now, so one of his ideas was to try to suss out how we make moral choices. And he does this by what he calls harmless taboo stories. Okay? And, and by harmless, he means no one gets hurt in the story. And by taboo, he means it feels like it's breaking some sort of established expectation. So I'm going to um, read you a few of his harmless taboo stories, and I want you to think about, and maybe even vote with your hands, but whether something is immoral or not. Now here's the key. I'm not asking if you would do it, okay? I'm guessing you wouldn't do any of these things. I'm asking if you think it's a moral question or not. And I'm not going to tell you if there's a right or wrong answer. I'm not even sure if there is. Um, I just want to, you know, kind of run this through your head, okay? So I'm going to give you three of his harmless taboo stories. Here's the first one. A woman is cleaning out her closet, and she finds her old American flag. She doesn't want the flag anymore, so she cuts it up into pieces and uses the rags to clean her bathroom. Okay. And the question is, is that immoral? Not would you do it, is it immoral? I'm just curious, hands for who feels like that's immoral? Okay, great, great, love it. Here's another one. Um, <laughs> this is a little grosser, I apologize. Uh, these aren't mine. Uh, a family's dog was killed by a car in front of their house. They had heard that dog meat was delicious, so they cut off the dog's body and cooked it and ate it for dinner. Nobody saw them do this. Okay? Raise your hand if you like that's immoral. Okay? Raise your hand if you think that's disgusting. Okay, everybody. Yeah, okay, great, good. All right, I got one more. Um, this was a, a, a project where they had people come in and, and try to answer these questions. And so uh, one of the questions that they had people answer um, was they offered these research subjects $2. This was an in-person interview. $2 if they would sign a piece of paper. And that paper said, I, you need to write your name, so I, Jim, hereby sell my soul after my death to this researcher's name was Scott, to Scott for the sum of $2. There's a line for a signature on this form, and below the line is a note. This form is part of a psychology experiment. It is not a legal or binding contract in any way. And Scott would literally give people $2 if they would sign this form. Um, so raise your hand if you like signing that form is immoral. Yeah, okay, super interesting, great, okay, thank you. Um, we're we're going to come back to all of those because I think they're all really interesting and important. Um, but let's, let, let, we're going to change gears. Let's talk about what makes something moral or immoral. And so I want to do that by talking about Solomon. Uh, S Solomon, such a fascinating figure in the story of Scripture, okay? So Solomon, as we've already mentioned, um, at the end of his life is so incredibly um, led astray by his many wives to a variety of idolatry that God decides we're going to have to divide the nation into two. Like, he's really, really bad news. But at the beginning of his life, he does it, everything so well, right, that God says, like, I'm unbelievably proud of you, and I'm going to bless you in all these amazing ways. So, I want you to notice what Solomon gets right in this story, because it's really, really important for us if we think about what is moral or immoral or amoral. Um, God comes to Solomon and he asks him the, the genie question, hey, if you could have anything, what would you want? And Solomon says, I want a heart uh, that discerns between good and evil, right? I, I want a heart, uh, I, I want the ability to, to, to judge in righteousness um, this people because I'm intimidated by the job and I, I, I need a mind and a heart that can know what's, what's good and evil. Uh, and I hope you noticed that God really likes this request, right? In fact, God, it says it's pleasing to God. Um, literally, it says it's tov to God, right? It was good to God. It's tov to God. Uh, so, back up with me all the way to the story of Genesis, uh, because we've had this conversation many times. It's a super important part of the story of Scripture. Fundamental to the original sin in the garden is the desire of humans to decide for themselves what's good and bad, right? Remember that there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of tov and ra, and they want to eat from the tree so they can be the ones to decide what's good and what's evil, right? That's like the fundamental sin. Rather than trusting God to tell us what's good for our lives, um, Adam and Eve say, no, we'd like to make our own decisions about that. So here is Solomon, like trying to correct the original sin in himself, 
That, that's, what he, that's why this is so incredibly exciting to God. God is like a proud papa who's at like for the first time ever, his son has like aced a test, and he's like, no one's ever aced this test before, and I'm, you're amazing, and yes, I'm going to give you what you asked for. That's what I want everyone to ask for. I want everyone to come to me to figure out what's good and evil instead of trying to figure it out themselves. And because you asked for that, I'm going to give you all this other stuff too, right? Have some money, and have some, it's like you get some money, and you get some money. And, and, and God's like overwhelmingly excited. However, there is an if. And I hope you notice this. God says, hey, I love that you want this. It's good to me that you want this, and I'm going to give it to you and make you unique, and I'm going to give you what you didn't ask for. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. This is so incredibly important. God says to Solomon, hey, um, you asked the right question. You're going to get the, the reward that you asked for, but please don't ever think that the gift I'm giving you, this wisdom of knowing good and evil, can exist separate from me, right? If you start thinking that, you're right back to Adam and Eve, right? I need you to stay in my word. I need you to stay in my commandments and my decrees and recognize that the wisdom I'm giving you is connected to a relationship with me. And I think uh, that this prayer that, that Solomon prays, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind, able to discern between good and evil, is a prayer that like every Christian maybe should pray. And I think um, we have in Romans this idea that God wants to answer every one of us the way He answers Solomon. He wants to give us that gift. Um, and in fact, Paul says what was unique for Solomon through the power of the Holy Spirit can be almost universal for the church. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It's the same idea, right? Solomon wants to know good and evil in light of God, and Paul says, hey, every Christian should want to know good and evil in light of God's Word. But just like with Solomon, Paul tells us, hey, there is an if and a then here, right? To to know God's will in the world, to know what's good to God and pleasing to God requires us to like not be conformed to this world. Um, The Greek word is systematized. Don't be systematized to this world, um, but be transformed, metamorphosed, be metamorphosed into a renewing of your mind. So, um, I want to think uh, that what Solomon does wrong ultimately is he fails because he conforms to the pattern of this world, right? He, he gets all these gifts, but then he starts conforming, and he drifts away from his relationship with God, and he starts thinking the wisdom is his own. And I think there's immense pressure on us to do the same thing today, to conform to the pattern of this world. So, uh, just in this area… Of, of political authority today. Um, I want to think about what it means for us to not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This week, I, I went to a, a webinar um, by uh, Arthur Brooks, who I mentioned a few weeks ago. He wrote this book, Love Your Enemies, that I, I really enjoyed. Uh, and it, Arthur Brooks is a scholar at the Harvard Kennedy Business School, and he is a happiness scholar. So, like, what he does is he researches happiness all the time and what makes people happy and what doesn't make people happy. Super interesting job. Uh, And uh, one of the areas that uh, he tries to suss out is, hey, are there any, like, levers we can pull to increase happiness in people? And, And by the way, we don't have time for all this, but he basically says happiness is not an emotion, right? Happiness is a sense of satisfaction and purpose in your life. So, uh, He's looking for, like, levers that we can pull that increase human happiness. And he says, um, with all this data that he and others have accrued, um, he's able to, to identify individual things that really lead us to being more or less happy. One of the things that was really fascinating is he said, um, on, there's a survey they did for the, I don't know how many people, lots and lots of people. Um, And it looked at everything, all kinds of different topics. It wasn't a political survey, but one of the questions was, um, are you a person who's involved or interested in politics? 
And after controlling for all other factors like age and economics and mental health and all these things, they found that people who selected, I am someone very interested in politics, were 8% less likely to describe themselves as very happy. That's real interesting to me, right? Uh, everything else aside, not, doesn't mean what party you're in, just anybody that described themselves as very interested in politics was about 8% less likely to be very happy um, by their own description of their lives. So, he was trying to figure out why that was, uh, and he had some really interesting um, suggestions. He said, one thing is, uh, it seems like um, right now being very interested in politics usually means being upset, right? Like everybody's angry all the time. Uh, and, and he talked about, you guys remember Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex? Uh, well, Brooks talks about the outrage industrial complex. I really like that phrase. Uh, and what he says essentially is we have all these systems, right, the media and political parties and all kinds of people who are really deeply invested in you being outraged. They want you to be angry. And by the way, people that are angry all the time are usually not happy all the time. And he says, hey, um, those people in the outrage industrial complex um, don't care if you're happy. They just want your money or your votes or your views or your clicks or whatever it is that makes them more money off of you because, like, you're a consumer of their product. He went on to say, um, one in six Americans are not talking to their family members because of politics. That's wild to me, right? That's wild to me. So, um, Brooks's point was not that caring about politics is bad. His point was the amount that we care is what matters. Like, it would be weird if you just didn't care, right? These are important things in our world, and you ought to have an opinion, and that's good. But if you care so much that you value your political opinion over your relationship with someone in your family, that seems problematic, doesn't it? Like, the idea of idolatry is simply to put anything above God in your life. But if something comes above my family in my life, that seems, and it's not God, that seems like a kind of idolatry already, isn't it? And, and so he says, hey, really simply, I, I don't want you to not care. I don't want you to not be passionate. I don't want you to be so passionate that it ruins relationships and isolates you and makes you unhappy all the time. So, um, what would it look like? Um, for our um, minds to be renewed through the transforming power of God on a topic just like this. Um, so, here's a couple ideas. Um, one idea, again, this is, this is a Brooks idea. I really love it. He says, think about political news the way you think about alcohol, okay? Uh, if you are a person who has a healthy relationship with alcohol and you have a glass of wine at dinner, that's perfectly fine, and, and assuming you're 21, uh, that's perfectly fine, right? And I, I, I don't drink, but I understand it tastes good to some people who are weird, and I understand that um, <laughs> apparently there are certain health effects. My wife and my mother-in-law are convinced that red wine is good for them. I don't know. Anyway, um, in moderation, that's fine, right? If you are sneaking away at all hours of the day, if you wake up and need alcohol and have to have it before you go to bed and eat it in the middle of your work day and eat it constantly, you have a problem, right? So, same thing with political news, right? You know, have 15 minutes of political news a day, like just to see what's going on in the world of politics, great, do it. That's healthy. That's fine. But if you consume it all the time, like if, you, if you're constantly going back to find more and more, if you can't get enough talk radio and podcast and TV and uh, like at some point, like you're consuming political news like an alcoholic consumes alcohol, we have a problem, right? And it's going to make you less happy, by the way, it's also going to make you less informed, which was super interesting. Um, but uh, Brooks said that the average person who consumes more than two hours of political news a day is less informed in terms of factual issues happening than someone who consumes zero hours of political news a day. But that was really wild. Anyway, um, what I want us to recognize uh, is that the, the danger here. Um, is it really the other side? It's my side. Like, I don't, I don't listen to two hours of people I disagree with every day. That would make me just unbelievably miserable, right? We listen to people that we agree with. And the problem of being in an 
echo chamber of people that agree with you all the time, or as you forget that there are other people out there that you love and care about who feel differently about things. You begin to forget that those people that the outrage industrial complex wants you to hate are the ones Jesus died for too, and that He calls us to love people that we disagree with and want their good even at our expense. So, um, I think part of the challenge for us of being transformed by the renewing of our minds is to say, hey, let's limit um, the consumption of stuff that's not helpful, healthy for us. But here's another maybe bigger idea for us. Um, I think that in this um, crazy world of our American politics, or especially in the church, um, I think there is value in us disagreeing. Um, this is probably because I'm a Presbyterian, and the Presbyterian tradition, um, we don't have like one person who has all the power. We have like groups of people. We have committees and elder boards and deacon boards, and they get together, and they like talk about things and hash it out and vote, and we think that we hear from God better in community, and when more than one perspective is lifted up, like I might get a better idea of what God wants rather than just like Jim Gates being the dictator. Uh, and so, uh, and on some basic level, I, I think that connects with me well, but I also think it's Paul's central idea of what it means to be the church, that we are the body of Christ with different members doing different functions, but still one in Christ and members of each other. So, I think there's something that we offer each other in our differing political opinions when we are trying to filter those opinions through the story of Scripture, even when we come up with different conclusions. I think that's something that's really valuable for us. So, come back to my harmless taboo stories for a minute. Um, Jonathan Haidt says that there are uh, six moral categories. This is really interesting. Uh, and he says, most of our moral questions fall into one of these six categories. And he says those categories are fairness and uh, he calls it liberty or oppression, and harm, like are people being harmed, and authority, and loyalty, and sanctity. And so, most of the questions that I asked you guys were not on the topics of harm. By definition, they were harmless taboo categories, and they weren't really about liberty. No one's being oppressed in those stories, and they're not really about fairness, right? I asked you questions about the last three groups of things. Um, so, like the dog story, I, I got to, sorry, I got to tell you something. Um, so, when I'm, um, when I'm quoting something, I, I take notes, you know, I put notes on my iPad, and, and I usually don't type out a quote. I'll usually hit a dictate button, and I'll just dictate the, the thing I'm dictating to get the quote right for a sermon. Uh, so, last, um, whenever it was, I think it was last night I was putting in one of these quotes about the dog eating, eating the dog thing, and so I hit the button, and I'm dictating it. As I'm dictating that story, my dog walks into the room and climbs up onto the sofa with me, and I look at him, and I'm like, I finished dictating. I'm like, dude, I'm so sorry. I would never eat you. It was a very awkward moment in my life. Um, that's for free. Um, so, so Haidt says oh, we, we have these six different moral receptors. And this is really interesting. He says that um, people that identify themselves as liberal or conservative um, feel those different moral receptors in different ways. Okay? So, uh, will you put up my first picture for a minute? Um, I literally just took a picture out of his book, so I apologize for the quality of this image. Um, th this is what Haidt says is how um, um, American social conservatives see those six categories. Uh, and so you see care and harm as someone being hurt, liberty and oppression, um, you know, someone's rights being taken from them, fairness and cheating, is everyone getting a fair deal, loyalty, or am I being faithful to my group? authority, am I honoring those above me, and sanctity, uh, which is more like a holiness or a purity kind of question, right? Uh, and, and he says, in a nutshell, um, in the conservative tradition in America, they tend to see all six of those categories as fairly equally important. Not always equally important, but, but all significant. Leave that up for a minute. Um, so, Haidt says, uh, that tradition tends to focus on social cohesion, uh, have less excitement about new experiences, more concern about threats, and sees systems as good ways to retrain individuals from their inclination to selfishness, systems like families and churches, etc. Okay? All right. Does that make sense? Are we good? 
Okay, we're going to go to the next one. Um, the next one is how he sees, thank you, um, the, the American liberal matrix. And I want you to notice something. All six categories are still there, but they're not all equally weighted. And so he says, in the, in the Ameri- and this is heights, but I think he's got something here. In the American liberal um, movement, the most important concern is, is anyone being hurt? Right? Is there any harm being done to another person? It's a really interesting idea. So that's their biggest weight, right? Followed by liberty and oppression. Is anyone, uh, anyone's rights being trampled? Followed by fairness. Is everyone getting a fair deal? And the last three of loyalty and authority and sanctity are still there. They're just less emphasized. Okay? Now, stay with me for a minute because this is really interesting. He says uh, in that liberal tradition, we have Uh, an emphasis on individualism. They have more excitement about new experiences. They have less warning about threats. They have more of a sense of the goodness of people and recognize evil happening in systems above people. So, uh, when… when uh, th- you can take that away. Thank you. So when, when Haidt does these interviews, like he asks that question about, you know, would you be willing to sell your soul to me for two dollars? Uh, he says, well, one of the people he talks to is an atheist, and the atheist, like, doesn't believe in God, and doesn't have a high view of the sanctity um, element of morality, but like sort of intrinsically doesn't want to do it. And so this atheist young man says, no, I'm not going to sign that document. I don't feel good about it. And then they ask him afterwards, tell me why. And, and he recognizes he doesn't want to do it, but he can't put words to it, right? He doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in the soul, doesn't believe in afterlife, but just it feels wrong to him. Uh, and, and that's the idea of somebody who like, doesn't have a really developed sense of sanctity, but still has it. It's still there, right? It's just for him a, a different emphasis. So I think what we have here in the, in the words of Cool Hand Luke, what we have here is a failure to communicate, okay? Um, for the, the people who identify in that liberal movement um, who focus particularly on care for others and liberty and fairness, especially care and liberty, they look at the conservative movement in America, and it feels like they don't care enough, right? They don't care enough. And in the conservative movement, um, who have an f- uh, equal focus on those six areas, they look at the liberal movement and they say it feels like they don't um, even pay attention to loyalty or authority or sanctity, right? Are, are you with me? We have a failure to communicate. Uh, and, and here's what I want to say. I want to say… Um, that Paul did not intend us to take this language of the body and apply it to all America, but I think he does intend it to be applied to all the church. And I think if we apply this right, if we think about what it means to be a one body, and if we remember that discerning good and evil begins in our relationship with God and through the pages of Scripture, I think we can begin to say uh, that we need members of the church who have both of those perspectives. We need Christians um, who can see the value of individual freedom, who can stand up against social injustice, who can call out institutions that are ungodly. These are like the Martin Luther King Juniors of the church, right? And we need Christians who see the value of stable families and coherent communities, who defend um, biblical values around healthy human relationships, who recognize that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I don't have a perfect one for this, but they're kind of like the like the Billy Grahams a little bit of the church, if you were. And, and I think, um, boy, we need both those voices, right? If I look back in the 20th century, any list of the most impactful American Christians has to include both Billy and Martin, right? I mean, it's got to. And, and I think both of them offered critical messages to the Christian church and the season in which they were ministering that we desperately needed. And I wonder if I wonder how things might have been different if we could have, like, brought those together even more. So, uh, Billy Graham and Martin Luther King were actually um, friends, or at least acquaintances and and friendly, uh, and they did some ministering together. In fact, Dr. King spoke at some of uh, Reverend Graham's crusades, uh, and they they had a little bit of a falling out, and the falling out happened largely because uh, at one point, Dr. I'm sorry, uh, Reverend Graham went to Texas and did a crusade there, and he was endorsed by the governor of Texas, who then was a staunch segregationist. And Dr. King was really offended by that and begged him not to go, or begged him not to take the endorsement, rather. Uh, and then later, uh, Dr. King asked um, Graham to come be part of the March on Washington, and, and at the time, Billy wasn't sure he wanted to do that, and so he didn't. And, and, I, and I look back today, and I think, boy, those two 
um, represented the best of their traditions and in so many beautiful ways impacted our whole nation and the church within it. But what if, like what might have been different if Dr. King had gone with Graham and spoke at those crusades in Texas? What might have been different if if Graham had been on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial next to Dr. King uh, on the March on Washington? Like, what might have been different if the church had said, hey, both of these voices are so incredibly important for us because they're calling us to be more of the fullness of who God is, not all one part of the body, but separate parts and members together in Christ. Uh, actually, yeah, um, uh, th- this is a, a picture from a, a time when the two of them did a joint effort. And um, I-, I am aware, by the way, that at the end of his life, um, Reverend Graham said one of his greatest regrets was not being more involved with Dr. King and his work. And of course, Dr. King didn't have the privilege to look back on his life in that same way. I wonder what he might have said if he had. But I-, I think that the call of the church to renew our mind in Christ at least partly means to recognize that the body offers something together it cannot offer separately. And in this whole topic of our political discourse, I think we are absolutely supposed to disagree. It's great. Disagree all you want. Passionately disagree. But in the church, let's do that with the shared goal of seeking the will of God in the pages of Scripture and trying to understand the other person rather than just trying to defeat them, to listen but not demonize, to state our positions rather than belittling other people for theirs, to consider that our sisters and brothers might have different conclusions but the same motivations to love God and love our neighbor. Guys, I I deeply believe uh, that Satan wants the church divided over this issue. He wants our witness divided. He wants us to pick teams and take shots at each other. He wants us motivated by fear and contempt for other people and political idolatry. He wants us to submit to the powers, including the the outrage industrial complex. But his passion is his weakness because I cannot imagine a more powerful witness to the world than Christians who passionately disagree, loving each other even more passionately in the middle of our election season or our ongoing political debate. I cannot imagine a more powerful witness for the world to what it means to be united in Christ than to say, hey, this doesn't divide us because we're family and family comes first. And to say, hey, I'm going to ascribe good motivations to the other even when I disagree with the other's conclusions. I think this election season is an opportunity for us as the church to model for the world what a transformed mind looks like when Jesus is the center of identity and nothing else is, and for the world to see us striving to discern from Scripture and from the Spirit what is tov and what is ra, and striving to apply that wisdom to our whole lives so that they might see in the end that we are a people who serve Christ over Caesar. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
I'm going to invite Bob and Kristen and Jesse to come join me up front. We have the privilege this morning of uh, installing and ordaining uh, new deacons and installing a new elder into our church family. And uh, as we just discussed, part of our identity is that we're a community that believes the Spirit speaks through lots of us when we come together. And so, uh, you have called uh, already and elected these folks, uh, Kristen and Jesse, as deacons and Bob as an elder. Uh, and now, our tradition requires them to take what's essentially an oath of office as they affirm their calling and answer our constitutional questions. So, um, Bob and Jesse and Kristen, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and head of the church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? I do. Do you accept the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness of Jesus, to Jesus Christ in the church universal, and God's Word to you? Do you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith, as expressed in the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Y'all are doing great. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Bob, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Jesse and Kristen, will you be a faithful deacon? teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ, will you? Would the congregation please rise? Do we, the members of the church, accept Bob, Jesse, and Kristen as ruling elders or deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? At this time, I'm going to invite Jesse and Kristen to kneel, and I'm going to invite all of our elders and deacons to come forward and uh, join us in the laying on of hands as we celebrate their ordination. Come in the middle. Huh? <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the calling of the church. We thank You that You have called us to be a light to the nations, that You've called us to be a city on a hill, that we are salt and light in this world. And we thank You for those who have answered the call to be leaders in the church, who have been willing to give of their time and their energy uh, to serve You and to serve Your people. We thank You, Lord, that we are the church. It's not a building. It's a people, that wherever we go, we carry the invitation to invite the world to come and to know You. And we pray, Lord, that in our unity uh, and in our um, one body in Christ, we can model for the world um, what a reconciled humanity looks like. 
We thank you especially for Jesse and Kristen who are um, entering into their first term of service as uh, deacons, and we ask that your Spirit would equip them uh, to do this work better than they might humanly be able to do, uh, that they would cooperate with you, and that you would set them aside for this holy purpose, uh, to be our ambassadors and our leaders and our ministers and your servants to us. We thank you for um, Bob and for all who have answered the call to serve, who are already ordained but take on additional terms of responsibility and duties. And we ask, Lord, that through all of our leaders, you would help us to continue to follow faithfully after Jesus, our Lord. It's in His name we pray. In His name we offer the prayer He taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Congratulations, guys. Y'all can stand up. Welcome into the ordered ministry of the church and all that you do. May you do it to the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Congratulations, buddy. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations to you too. <laughs> uh, as our elders and deacons um, make their way back to their seats, um, I want to… What am I doing? Oh, hey, uh, I want… You guys can sit down. That's what I'm doing. Um, I want to just hold up uh, a couple of prayer requests for our family of faith. Um, we, we celebrated the life of Harvey Fraser yesterday, and we ask continued prayers for his family as they mourn his loss and celebrate uh, his new life in Christ. We also want to give thanks. I don't know that I shared this last week, but two weeks ago, um, Zach and Abby Kinetter had their little girl, uh, Haley Kinetter, and so um, we thank God for her and ask for blessings. Um, oh, sorry, Waylon, wrong baby, Waylon Kinetter, Waylon, not Haley, Waylon. Uh, and so we ask blessings for Waylon and for Zach and Abby as they uh, begin that new journey. Um, we now have the privilege of giving back to God um, our first fruits, our tithes, our additional offerings. So in a moment, our ushers will come forward to collect those gifts. And when they do that, we'd also really love it if you would drop your connection card in the plate so we know that you're here. And if you have a need for prayer, we love that too. You can share that prayer request right on the back of that card. Let's continue to worship.
highlight four quick things for you. The first is that next week is uh, the beginning of a new sermon series for us. We're going to be talking about um, this book and what it means that it's an authority for us and how we got it and how we apply it to our lives. Uh, and so we're calling that series Self versus Scripture. Should be a lot of fun. Um, next Sunday is also an invitation Sunday for us. So we'd love for you to think about who you might invite to join you for worship next week who maybe doesn't have a church home. There are invitation cards at the hub. So if you walk out those doors, um, take some off the hub and give them away. Invite somebody to come worship with you next week. Also next week, uh, we are, uh, after this service and after the following service, we'll have a, a conversational conver nope, a congregational conversation about our um, plans for renovating our fellowship hall and kitchen. We've got pictures to share. It's going to be exciting. So that'll be after worship at all of our services next week. Uh, and if you can't make it next week, we'll do it again the following week. It's the same conversation, just in case your life is busy. We'd love for you to stick around afterwards for 30 minutes maybe and hear about that story. You'll also get some stuff in the mail next week about what we're going to be planning. Um, we are doing um, some hurricane relief work. So if you'd like to give towards um, the victims of um, both of the recent hurricanes that have happened and everyone who's been affected, um, we're going to be di directing donations towards Samaritan's Purse and their work. Um, you can just write a check out to the church and um, put hurricane relief on the memo line so we make sure it goes in the right direction. We will send that out as that comes in. Uh, and then our last thing is that our Kringle sale is um, ongoing. If you want to buy Kringles, you can do that in the fellowship hall after the service. If you want to buy Kringles for our Hearts of Hope families, you can do that there too. Uh, I think we're trying to raise uh, 100 Kringles for Hearts of Hope families, and we're, we got four done, so we're almost there. So um, get in while you still can. Uh, Last, um, if you're here for the first time, we are so thankful you're with us, and we have a gift for you in the narthex. It's a book by John Ortberg called What is God's Will for My Life? It's a simple, short little read. I think it can be greatly impactful for you. I hope you'll pick one up. Now, sisters and brothers, I pray that as you go out into the world today, you would witness to the world through your love and grace and unity what it means to be a people who are transformed in their minds through the power of Christ. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.